grateful to see each and every one of you here, and I'm thankful for all of the love and support shown to my family and I as it relates to why you're here, especially today. We know that this is the official first day of me being truly an under-shepherd to the flock, serving the people of God, by the grace of God being the chief servant next to the Lord Jesus as it relates to this family of God. And so I am very grateful for all of your support, for everyone who has come out, but above all things, I especially solicit your continued prayers. Um, my desire is not to be status quo in any stretch of the term. My desire is to do exactly what God says to do in the position that is being occupied. It is a very solemn thing. And in my mind, there are three things that are very sacred for a man to occupy. One is the position of husband. Very sacred. Two is the position of father. Very, very sacred. And three is the position of pastor. Very, very sacred. And so this word cannot be taken lightly. So I solicit your continued prayers because I am a frail man in the need of Jesus just like anybody else. But to whom much has been given, much will be required. And so I solicit your prayers. Today we are going to spend some time in the word. And we're going to be looking at what God has to say as it relates to what really is the purpose of the church. And I've been prayerful about this, and I believe the Lord has a message for us today. And so I want to encourage you to take out pen, take out paper, take out your phones to take notes, whatever way you do it best. Have your Bibles with you, most importantly, and we will be going through the word. But as we prepare to do that, let's first have a word of prayer. Now, I'm going to go to my knees to pray. If you would like to join me in kneeling, please do so. If you cannot kneel, then just bow your heads reverently where you are. But let us all pray together as the Lord prepares our heart to receive the word. Our Father in heaven, we are very grateful for this privilege and opportunity to hear heaven speak to each and every one of us, for we know that there is a word for us from heaven. And Lord, we avail ourselves to you at this time, and we ask you to please take our lives and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. We ask for the presence of your Holy Spirit. We pray for the forgiveness of our sins. And we ask you to give us ears to hear what your spirit wants to say to the church at this time. And so abide with us now and make your words plain, we pray. And may we all come up a little higher on Jacob's ladder, ultimately, to arrive in the arms of Jesus is our prayer we ask today. In Jesus' name, let everyone say, Amen. I want you to turn your Bibles with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 16. Matthew, the 16th chapter. There's so much packaged in this chapter, but we'll just unfold just a little bit of it. We're looking at Matthew chapter 16, and when you get there, just simply let me know by saying amen. In Matthew, the 16th chapter, the Bible makes a very powerful statement as it relates to a dialogue that Jesus is having with his followers, and I want us to see what it says as we pick up in the story in verse 13. The Bible says in Matthew 16 and verse 13, it says, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Well, some say that thou art John the Baptist, and some Elias, and other Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto him the most crucial thing that I believe he says to every single professed child of God. He then says, But whom do you say that I am? Because at the end of the day, family, that's what matters. It doesn't matter what other people say. You and I are not going to be held accountable before God on what other people say. You and I are going to be held accountable before God for what we say or not say about him. And so that's a very crucial question that Jesus asks when he says, I hear you, but who do you say that I am? It indicates personal relationship. 
It indicates it's not enough to know what others have said about God. You need to know what you say about God, where you stand personally and individually. There is neither a man or woman on this planet that has either a heaven or hell to put any of us in. And so we need to learn how to not put our stock in people, respect people, love people, cherish and encourage people. But I don't read a single word in scripture that tells us to put our trust in people. I've never read that before. And if you read it, you need to check your translation of the Bible. God is very clear. Cursed be the man that puts his trust in man. Jeremiah 17, 5. But blessed is the man who puts his trust in the Lord. Jeremiah 17, 7. And so God wants all of us to cultivate an individual walk with him. It's not enough of what everybody else says. Who do you say that I am? Well, let's follow the answer. So here it is that now in verse 16, it says, And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjonov, but for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Peter was led by the Spirit of God and gave the right answer. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And I love what Jesus says next, which is going to bring us to the crux of the message for today. He then says in verse 18, and I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my what? I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I am thankful for this promise. I'm very thankful for this promise. Today, the picture of churches in our modern society in the United States of America, let alone the world at large, is not necessarily a very good picture. In North America, church attendance is declining, and this is before COVID. Church attendance, declining. Belief in organized religion, declining. People becoming, who attend church, people in church are becoming more secularized. And it almost seems like God, Jesus, and the Bible is becoming more and still more irrelevant. Somebody says, well, how do you prove that? Well, here's the way we prove it. If we are children of God, let's assume that we are indeed children of God, Christians. Do you know what Christians do? They follow Jesus' example. Isn't that right? That's what a Christian is, a follower of Christ. By definition, that's the word Christian. Do you know that Jesus made a statement? And the statement that Jesus made is very powerful. Go to John chapter 5. Let me show you. In John the 5th chapter, I want you to see a statement that Jesus made. And I just want us to remember, remember, we're Christians. If, if we are Christians, then we're followers of Christ. And being a follower of Christ means the example he left for me is what I do now in my day-to-day -day life. Well, here it is that in John chapter 5, there was something Jesus said that I believe was indicative of how he lived his life and therefore an example of how we should live our lives. The Bible says in the book of John, the fifth chapter, if you're there, please say amen. It says in John 5, right there in verse 30, Jesus says, I, now keep in mind, this is the son of God, okay? This is the one who testified that he created the heavens and the earth, etc. Jesus says, I can of my own self do how many things? I can do nothing. How could Jesus do nothing? Jesus can do everything. He's Emmanuel, God with us. How could Jesus do nothing? Well, here's the context of what he said. Let's continue in the verse. He says, I can of my own self do nothing. He said, I judge and my judgment is just because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. Jesus left for you and I an example that whatever we do in life, we will not do it unless we are convinced that it's God's will first. Are you following that? That means that before you say yes to a man, when he says, will you marry me? You first have to make sure it's God's will. 
That means that before you say to that woman, will you marry me, you must first make sure it's God's will. That means that when you choose what school you're going to go to, you first want to make sure it's God's will, not just merely your parents' will. It means that whatever decisions you make in life, first and foremost, is this the will of God for my life? But this type of thinking is dying. It's not dead, thank the Lord. But it's dying. We have lots of ideas, we have lots of goals, we have lots of objectives, we have lots of things that we want to accomplish and do, and I get it, family, but we must remember the example man. Jesus himself said, I can of my own self do nothing. We must get to the place that we can say, we of our own selves, we of our own selves. Please understand, Jesus could have done anything he wanted to. You remember one day a whole bunch of guys showed up, and they were getting ready to nab Jesus? And Peter took out that sword. He's ready to kill one of those brothers. And Jesus says, put up your sword. Jesus said, don't you know if I wanted to? He said, if I wanted to, I can call a legion of angels to deliver me right now. But then you know what he said next? He said, but how shall the scripture be fulfilled? In other words, Jesus, the creator of scripture, is now walking on earth, subjecting himself to scripture. Man, that takes humility. I mean, that takes some serious humility. You know how many times bosses violate their own rules? <laughs> you ever seen a police officer run a red light and he don't have a siren on? He's not chasing anybody. What is he doing? He's over-exercising his authority. We see this happen all the time in our common world. When you're the one who owns it, when you're the one who creates it, there's a little voice in our head that says you have a right to violate it. But that was not the example that Jesus left for us. He created scripture, and here it is. He's subjecting himself to scripture. This type of religion is what's dying in America today. But I'm so thankful that God is in the work of revival. And to revive is to take something that is dying and bring it back to life. And God wants us to understand that he made it very clear the church is something that he's going to build. The gates of hell will attack it, but it won't win. So prophetically, I already know I'm on the winning side, even though often things look like we're losing. Are you following that? That's important. I've seen a lot of people leave the church because they just keep seeing what's in front of them. They're walking by sight and not walking by faith. You got to trust the word of God only. God already said it. The gates of hell is going to attack. So when you see crazy stuff in the church, when you hear about bad ministers, when you hear about poor leadership, when you hear about crazy congregations, when you hear about compromises on doctrine or whatever it may be, say, praise the Lord, the word of God is true. The gates of hell is attacking. But thank the Lord, the gates of hell will not prevail. It's not going to win. It's winning battles, but we win the war. So what God wants to do now is to revive our minds on our understanding of church. What is this church? This is what we have to understand. What is a church? When God says that the, I'm going to build up my church, this is the first time the word church comes up in the Bible. First time, Matthew 16, 18, first time. So when you look at the word church, the word church is very powerful because whatever it is, is something that Jesus is going to build up. He holds himself responsible. And as he builds it up, he makes it clear it'll be attacked, but it won't it, the, the enemy power won't prevail against it. Now, I want you to watch this. When we look up the word church, always remember the Bible was not originally written in English. It was written in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. When you deal with the New Testament, you're dealing with Greek. The Greek word for church is a powerful term. It's called ecclesia. And the word ecclesia means the called out ones. The called out ones. A congregation, an assembly of called out ones. Now here's my question. Called out of what? Go to the book of 1 Peter chapter 2. Let's find out. In 1 Peter, the second chapter, 
called out of what? I want to understand the purpose of church. Because family, you got to understand, I come from hip hop, right? I come from the hip hop culture. I come from the R&B culture. I used to dance and perform and choreograph for many celebrities that are on television to date. Some of the videos that I did with these celebrities are still on YouTube and other places to date. And I remember these things. I just saw one of my dear friends that we danced in the entertainment industry together just a week or so ago as he had to bury his son. And here it is that I'm looking back at this and I remember when I left the entertainment industry, I left it to become part of God's church. You don't leave something that pays you thousands upon thousands per month. You're a celebrity. People serve you hand over fist. I mean, they provide everything for you. You got limousines picking you up in front of your house, etc. It was a very glamorous lifestyle. And God pulled me out of that because he knew there was a higher work for me to do. And when I left that to join his church, there was no way. I remember I met a bunch of young people when I joined the church. I was 20 years old at the time. I'm 49 today. And I remember when I joined the church, I saw a bunch of young people trying to act like the world in the name of Jesus. And I immediately looked at those young brothers and sisters and I was like, I have no time for you. Y'all don't even do it right. Like, literally, I was just, I watched young people in the church, grew up in the church, trying to act worldly. And I was like, you know, you need to stop it. You don't even do it right. It's clear you were homeschooled. And, that, and now, now watch this. That's not, my message to every homeschooled person, that's not a bad thing. Why do you think being corrupted is cool? That's what happened to me. I grew up corrupted. I grew up being educated in sin. I got a PhD in it. And what I'm saying is, is that that's nothing to boast about. It, one of the most beautiful testimonies is when you can testify of how unfamiliar you are with the things of this world. That's powerful to go against the grain when everybody else says, hey, why don't you go ahead and experiment with this? Why don't you do a little bit of that? And you would say like Joseph, I cannot do that and break the heart of my God. That's a real man. Any weakling can listen to peers tempt them and give in. That's a sign of weakness. A sign of strength is when everybody's trying to pull you in one direction or another and you say death before dishonor of God and his law is my motto. Wow. Oh, if we had strong characters like that. And so God wants us to understand that in these last moments in earth's history, the church, the ecclesia, the called out ones. We must get back to remembering what God called us out from. And that's why you're in 1 Peter chapter 2. See, you thought I forgot. I didn't forget anything. 1 Peter 2. In 1 Peter chapter 2, what does the Bible say right there in verse 9? It says in 1 Peter 2 and verse 9, but you are a what? Chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a peculiar people, a holy nation, and then it says, and God has called you out. Notice that you've been called out of darkness into his marvelous light. And we are to show the praises of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. This is the church, a group or an assembly of people who recognize I've been called out of darkness and called into God's marvelous light and I dare not hide it. I'm going to show forth the praises of him who did this just for me. That's the church. That's the church. A group, an assembly, a gathering of called out ones who realize they've been called out. This is why later on when Timothy was given the expression of what constitutes the church, this is how Timothy would put it. Timothy would make this statement when he when he was defining what what makes up God's church. Here's what Timothy says. It says in first Timothy three fifteen, it says, but if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. And then it says the pillar and ground of truth. When you don't know what the truth is, you were supposed to go to the church and find it. 
The church was supposed to be a place that was, as you can see, a tremendous support and the basis of where everybody could find out what truth was. That's what the church is supposed to be. And we're living in a time where we all need to know more truth. Because, boy, are we being fed a lot of lies. And nowadays, people don't even know how to make a decision in some of the most practical areas of their life. I get emails and text messages all the time. What do I do about this? What do I do about this? Should I do this? Should I not do that? And I dare not give people my opinion. My opinion's worthless. What I give them is God's words. I'll say, okay, well, here's what God says. Why don't you read that? You pray and ask God to make it plain to you, and then you follow as the Spirit of God leads you. That's that. But when God defines his church, this ecclesia, this group of called out ones, God says that are the people that are the pillar and ground of truth. That's what God wants you and I to be grounded so strong like a pillar. You know what pillars do. They hold up roofs. You take the pillars out of here. We're dead. And so they hold up the truth. So the church was supposed to be a place that when the world is filled with lies, it does not get more quiet. It gets more loud. That's what it does, because, again, what do pillars do? It holds up. What is it that we're holding up? God's truth. Be the price what it may. It takes courage to do that, doesn't it? A lot of it. God wants you and I to understand that this is his church. Now, understanding these points, brothers and sisters, I think we need to answer the question, what is truth? When you look to the Bible, you can see what truth is, because whatever the church is, it's a place of a gathering of a group of people who have been called out of darkness into his light that are holding up his truth. Well, what is truth? The Bible says it very clearly. John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. They're built on the word. The church does not give its opinion. And God help us when the pulpit is occupied giving a lot of opinions. That is not the place of any minister of the gospel. Ministers do not share what they think. They share what the word of God says. There's a difference. We don't share what we think because everybody has thoughts. And who says your thought? Listen, I'll be honest with you. I, I, that is a true waste of time to have to sit down and listen to what somebody thinks for an hour. That's almost punishment to me. Because I'm just kind of like, well, I got thoughts too. And if your thoughts are not superior to my thoughts... Then why did I come here? Just to hear your thoughts? I didn't come here to hear your thoughts. If ever you see an advertisement that says, come to open doors and hear the thoughts of Dwayne Lemon, I hope this room is empty. God's desire is that you hear his words. All I need to be is properly connected so that he can download to my mind his words and then I can go ahead and give you his words and then you take down the notes, you study his words and then you can say, oh yeah, that was the word. And then you follow it. The church was built up not to give opinions. It was built up to give the word of God to the people who need it desperately. But then on top of that, it also says, how be it? What else is truth? It says, how be it? When he, the spirit of truth is come. He will guide you into all truth. So the church is not only a group or assembling of people who have been called out of darkness into God's marvelous light to show forth the praises of him in teaching the word, but also demonstrating the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, it's one thing to have a message, and it's another thing for the message to have you. You agree with that? It's one thing to have a message. You ever met somebody who gave a great message, but the message obviously was not great to them? I remember growing up in the church in my earlier years when I was still very much unconverted. I was a member. I was sincere. I did want to learn some things, but I had a tremendous love relationship with sin, and I wasn't ready to break that relationship up. So I remember being in the church, and I would be in AYS, Adventist Youth Service, and I would tell all the young people, flee fornication. But guess what I was doing after sunset? I held positions in health and temperance, and I tell everybody else, eat healthy. But then all my God belly had to do was growl enough. 
Somebody said, God belly, what's that? Well, if you read Philippians 3, verses 18 and 19, it says there are many people who made their bellies their God. I had a God belly one time. That God belly, whatever it growled for, I fed it. If it said, I want this, I would say, yes, yes, I'd bow down to it. And I'd give it whatever it wanted. But I remember, I'm teaching people all sorts of health stuff, and then here it is, all my God belly had to do was growl enough, and I would go ahead and I would indulge, and I'd do it very secretly. I would find places and corners and make sure the saints don't come there. And I'd do everything I could to make sure none of these folks would find out my hypocrisy, and I did it. I would tell everybody, you got to deal patiently with people. I would encourage people that as an elder, and one day an elder got me mad, and I literally stepped in his face ready to fight him. Ready to fight him. And it's like the Spirit of God was saying, son, you have my message. But my message does not have you. This is a very serious problem. But how does God solve this problem? He says it's not enough to have the word, which is truth. He says you must have the spirit of truth as well. So that way it takes the concepts of God and makes it real and powerful and practical in the day to day life. What else does the Bible call truth? It says, Psalm 119, 151, Thou art near, O Lord, and all thy commandments are truth. God's commandments are truth. His law. And notice that it said all. It did not say most. Anyone who is taking any part of God's Ten Commandments and stripping it and trying to take out this part and that part and the other part, that is not indicative of what God's church, the pillar and ground of truth, would be doing in these last days. God's church is a pillar. It holds up the truth. It does not tear down the truth. And God's commandments, all of them, are truth. And at the end of the day, John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the truth. I am the truth. The church is central on the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything that we do, we ask ourselves the question, what would Jesus do? At every state, what would Jesus do in this situation? How does this best honor and reflect our Lord and our Savior? How do we make sure that even in what we do in the name of church, that we make sure we do it in the spirit of Christ? This is what God says in the last days is going to be attacked, but the gates of hell will not prevail. Now, the reason why this is important is because what I'm doing is I'm speaking to your intellect right now. And I want us to just understand that God has a church in these last days and there's an open door. To God's church. The Lord has bust the doors wide open because all the prophetic signs are showing us that Jesus is soon to come and his desire is to make sure that he can bring as many of his children home with him. But we need to understand that word called church, the ecclesia, the called out ones. What are we called out of? Darkness. What are we called into? his marvelous light, and what do we have to do with that light? Show forth the praises of him who did it. The church is a witnessing church. Any church that is not witnessing, any church that is not winning souls is a dying church. And by the grace of God, we will not have such a testimony here at Open Doors. God wants us to be a very working church. Understanding that, especially since COVID, we have more people dying than ever. I've seen the statistics. You know, there's a lot of people who believe strange things. And some of them believe that COVID was a hoax. They said, the whole thing's a lie, et cetera. And I'm just like, what kind of nonsense is that? Are you kidding me? If you just look, look at how many people die from heart disease every year. Look at how many people die from cancer every year. You see the numbers are fairly consistent. Heart disease is always in the 600s, 600,000 plus. Cancer is always in the 500s, 500,000 plus, and that's why cancer is number two, heart disease is number one. Brothers and sisters, just in this time period that we've had COVID-19, we've had more hundreds of thousands of people die. The heart disease numbers are still there. 
The cancer numbers are still there, but where in the world is this other hundreds of thousands of people coming from? It's coming from that disease. And the Bible makes it clear that disease is going to run rampant in these last days. So there's no question that this thing is real. And that should be something that motivates the gospel workers to be more active in the field. Not busy trying to preserve ourselves. Protect yourself. If you go out, you might want to wear gloves. If you go out, you can put your mask on. If you go out, take the precautions, but go out. Don't take all the precautions and still avoid everybody. That, that makes no sense to me. If you're following all the precautions and you're doing a lot of the things recommended, etc., that is more the reason for you to stop withdrawing and go out. And show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now, in doing that, we must lift up God's truth. But now I want to go ahead and transition from head knowledge to practical knowledge. We have to be practical in our approach with scripture. A gospel that is not practical is a worthless gospel. It's not enough for it to remain in our heads. It must transition to our heart and it must motivate us to Christ like action. So again, when we look at that term, we saw it. The church is the pillar and ground of truth. We already saw that the church is the pillar and ground of truth. We saw what the Bible calls truth. We already saw it. Thy word is truth. The spirit of truth. God's law is truth. Jesus is truth. We already saw that. So evidently, our time in the word. Now, I just want to speak to this. If you're on Facebook and you find Facebook is keeping your face out of this book, that's a problem. Are you following that? And that was once upon a time then when it was just Facebook. Now we got Snapchat, Instagram, and Twitter, and the rest. I mean, you can't keep up with it. They keep coming out with the new stuff. But what is it all designed to do? It's designed to just continually keep our faces out of this book, isn't it? Satan well knows that those whom he can get to neglect prayer and the searching of the scriptures will be overcome by his attacks. So now there's all these devices that are engrossing our minds. And we're finding some of the basic knowledge. You know, I can go to somebody today, been in the church for years, and say, repeat the Ten Commandments from memory. Commandment number one. Commandment number two. Commandment number three. Do you know how many of us don't even know that? And I mean, that's fundamental. Go to the average Christian. How long have you been in the church? 50 years. Wow, amazing. Do me a favor. Name the 12 disciples. Um, Peter. I know there was a Peter there. We want to go deep, but we don't even understand the basics. You understand that? Not good. God wants us to spend more time in his words, and we have to be honest with our precious hearts and realize, Lord, I have allowed my mind to be engrossed. You know, one of the things I love about Jesus is he doesn't just forgive. He actually loves doing it. One of the things I love about God is he's not just merciful. He loves being merciful. So God has plenty of forgiveness. I'm not here to condemn you. I'm here to encourage you. I'm here to caution you. And I'm here to let you know, family, be careful of what you allow to consume your mind. God says, my word is truth. Get into it. My spirit is truth. Ask for it daily. My law is truth. Test everything you do to make sure your life is in harmony with it. Jesus is the truth. Make sure at the end of the day, you're just like him. And this is why we move to practical. I want you to think about this. When we look at the word, the key word for me was sanctify. That word sanctify, as you can see on the screen, means to be made holy. So do you know what the Bible was supposed to do? It wasn't just supposed to make us more intelligent. It was supposed to show us how to be changed. 
Do you see areas in your life where you need to change? Do you see? Yeah, I'm a little rough with my words. I'm a little negligent. I realize that I have a short temper. I realize I gossip a lot. I realize that whatever it may be, whatever area it is in your life that needs to be changed, God says that's one of the purposes of the word. The Bible says sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So the, the purpose of Bible study, the purpose of spending time in the word is to see the areas in our lives where things need to be changed. This is why the best way to know right from wrong, test your actions to the word of God. Test it. Because you can feel 100% right about something and be 100% wrong, forgetting that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. That's God's testimony of the condition of yours and my heart. So never say, God knows my heart. Yes, he does, and he wrote about it. He said, the heart is deceitful. The heart is deceitful above all things. Listen, in other words, is there a lot of deceit in our world? Our hearts are more deceitful. Do you follow that? The heart is deceitful. Mom and dad, I love her. Your heart could be deceiving you. Mom and dad, I love him. Your heart could be deceiving you. Brother and sister, I, I'm, I'm married to a very wonderful woman. I mean, wow. I'm, I'm really married to an amazing lady. And I was affirming her up until this morning and just appreciating her uh, throughout the morning. And, and I will tell you that I had at least a couple of sisters before she ever became a reality in my life. And I thought I was going to marry them. And I remember saying to myself, you're going to be my wife. And she was like, I am? And I was like, yep. And she was all in for it. Circumstances and stuff happened. And those sisters are history. And oh, how I thank God for it. I thought that she was going to be the queen of my household. And over time, I discovered she was the witch of Endor. It was like literally all of a sudden I said, man, if I would have married her, I'd have had to deal with that. Praise God. I mean, I got happy. I was just like, man, thank the Lord. Now, my wife and I, 24 years in deep. Amen. Somebody comes to me today. Hey, Dwayne, do you regret it? It's not only that I would say, oh, no. I'll be like, no. You know, it's like, absolutely not. You know, when you really mean something, you always do that little spit thing for like, Pss. Pss. no, 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 no. I mean, you really mean it when you do that. Brothers and sisters, I, I mean, I am, I'm very thankful for my wife. And, you know, I've spent my ministry affirming my wife publicly and always saying how much I love her and I thank God for her because it's the truth, especially for her loving a crazy guy like me. And sticking through it all. <laughs> what I'm saying, my brothers and sisters, is our hearts can be so deceitful. We could think something is right. As a matter of fact, go to Proverbs 14. Let me show you. I'm, I'm going to show you something here. It's kind of deep. Pro go to Proverbs 14. You know, I remember my father. My father was the kind of man that he would call me and my brothers. And, you know, there were times that me and my brothers got in trouble. You go into Proverbs 14. And I remember that one time my dad looked me in the eyes. My father was a tall man, broad shoulders, and absolutely 0% fear of any human being. My father was a strong man, super strong. And I remember that when dad would speak, it could instill fear in your heart, you know, if, he, if he's upset. So one day dad came to me and he said, Dwayne, I need you to do such and such and such, and I need you to do it before I get back. Do you understand? And I was like, yes, sir. And then he was like, Dwayne. And he would call my name again, like seconds after, you know, he said what he said. And he would say, I need you to do such and such and such, and I need you to do it before I get back. Do you understand? And I was like, yes, Dad. The communication was very clear. My father had to repeat himself. And any time my father had to repeat himself, he was trying to communicate, I mean what I'm saying, and if you don't follow through, judgment lieth at the door. That was very clear communication from Wilson Lemon. Now, Proverbs 14, 12. Look at something our Heavenly Father says. Our Heavenly Father says in Proverbs 14 and verse 12, there is a way 
which seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. You think God meant that? Well, notice what he just said a couple of chapters later in Proverbs 16. Notice what the Bible says. We're looking at Proverbs 16 and verse 25. In Proverbs 16 and verse 25, notice what the verse says. There is a way which seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. God had to repeat himself. And whenever God repeats himself, he is trying to impress upon the heart of the reader or the listener, I mean what I'm telling you, pay attention, for if you disregard this, judgment lieth at the door. We can suffer. We can suffer. And so God says, I want you to understand that my word was given to humanity to communicate how you can be changed. Do not say you did the right thing just because you feel you did the right thing. Say you did the right thing because you compared it to the word of God and God can tell you you did the right thing. Are you following the difference? Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. This is how you do it, brothers and sisters. And so what God is showing here is that the whole purpose of my word is to show you how to become holy. Because that's the word sanctify. It means to make you holy. And to be holy is to be like God. The whole rationale of sanctification is that we might be like God. Let the word of God be your man of counsel. When it comes to the spirit, we're wrapping up here. The spirit. The Bible says, again, John 16, 13, we saw it. How be it when the, he, the spirit of truth, has come, he'll guide you into all truth. The word guide, hadegio, it means to lead. The spirit of God leads us. And where do you think the spirit of God leads us to? The word. I want you to see the, the teamwork here. The spirit of God is the one that will convict the heart. And then it points you to the word on how you can find washing and cleansing from the bad and brought back to the good. Never ignore the voice of God. How many times have you been upset about something, bothered about something, a little stubborn about something, and it seems like there's this almost what we would call an annoying voice. It's not trying to be annoying. It's trying to be a blessing. But sometimes the voice of God is letting you and I know through his spirit. He's letting us know the path you're on here is not the right path. You need to go back here. Look at what the word says. This is how the spirit of God leads us. And this is why it's not enough to study, but it's also important to pray. When you do something, when you and I make a decision, pray and ask for God through the power of his spirit. Lord, help me to see, did I do the right thing or did I do the wrong thing? The spirit of God leads us into all truth, all of his word. Don't build and defend your actions on one verse. Go to all of the truth and make sure that you're consistent. Because I can kill you and use a verse for it. I can practice bigotry and use a verse for it. There's a whole bunch of people who did that in the days of slavery here in America. They used Bible verses to tell the African slaves to be obedient, didn't they? Anybody can take a Bible verse and justify their most vehement evil actions. But the spirit of truth guides us into how much? All truth. You've got to go to all of the word of God and make sure the position is consistent. That's how you can know God indeed is leading. That's the spirit of God. And you know what the spirit of God does? That closing verse? He also gives us power to be witnesses that this truth still works. Are you following that? The Spirit of God gives power that we can be witnesses that this book is not outdated. You know, that's the mantra of today, isn't it? That's postmodernism. That is them saying the Bible doesn't work anymore. The Bible is irrelevant. You know what the Spirit of God does? He works with the heart, leads us to the word, gives us power to live a different life, and then we show it 
to others and it lets them know the word of God still works. Finally, the law of God. You remember, all thy commandments are truth. All of God's commandments. Hebrews tells us the goal of God is to take that law and to write it in our minds. And when something is in our minds, as a man thinks in his mind, so is he in his character. The law of God was not supposed to be something we repeat well. It was supposed to be something lived out in our day-to-day -day life. And it was all the, the commandments. commandments. You, you don't, don't keep, keep the Sabbath, but dishonor your, your father and your mother. mother. Young people especially need to hear that. You don't profess to keep the Sabbath, but then you dishonor your father and your mother. Parents, you don't keep the Sabbath and then make your children another God before you. You sooner work to please them than to please God. Are you following, family? The law of God is supposed to be lived out in the day-to-day -day life. And every single time we test our actions, not merely to the word, but especially to that magnifying glass, which is the law of the living God. You see, the more that we do that, brothers and sisters, Jesus, who says, I am the light of the world, Jesus says, guess what? Now you are the light of the world. Now you can show forth the praises. The more that we make a decision to be the ecclesia that God has called us to be, the easier it is to let the light so shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. My brothers and sisters, let's just be honest. A lot of us are still struggling in all these areas. A lot of us are still battling in these areas. We must understand that when we decide to be part of God's church, it is way more than joining a building filled with people that you see on a weekly basis. It is to fulfill the very purpose of why God raised up the church. And so, there may be some of us that says, you know what, I see that my, my life has not been consistent with the meaning of why God raised up the church. I have gotten to a place that I've become comfortable just kind of showing up, participating where I feel comfortable with it. But at the end of the day, I am very much still doing a lot of what just simply I want to do rather than what God wants. And God wants to make it very clear to you and I, if you continue and if I continue to function like that, that is not indicative of his idea of the call that was. And I think we need to get off of our idea and get on to his idea. And so the name of this church is called Open Doors. You know why? Because the doors are wide open. The doors are wide open to any precious soul who says, you know what? I've lived that other life and I want to take life more seriously. I want to take life a lot more seriously to let not my will, but let God's will be done. I want to fulfill the proper biblical picture of what God calls his church, as we study today. But while this door is open, Revelation 3 and verse 20 says that God is standing at the door of yours and my heart. And he says, and if any man will open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Jesus makes a difference. The name of this church is open door. You are welcome to come in, but the first step is, are you willing to open the door of your heart? And let Christ in. Because I prefer Jesus to lead you here to open doors than for you and I to lead ourselves here to open doors. Let Christ in the heart family. Let him be the means of doing it. And so my appeal is very simple. If there's anybody in this room that says, you know what? I've been a member of the church maybe for years, or maybe you're not a member of the church. But in either case, you can look and say, I have not fulfilled the idea of God when it comes to being his church, the ecclesia, the called out ones. I have not fulfilled that. But by the grace of God, today is a brand new day. Today I'm willing to surrender my life afresh to Christ and to cooperate with him. And I'm willing to open the door of my heart that he may come in and help me to be the kind of church he has called me to be. 
if that's you, could you please stand to your feet with me? I want to pray with you. I want to pray with you because you're going to need prayer. You're going to need a lot of it. And I know that the Lord will help you and bless you beyond expectations. And that's why you are standing. And I want to let you know, family, that I uh, am here, as stated, to serve, not to be served. And I want to know if there's anybody here that needs to be served. If you have never given your life to Christ for real, if you've never made that decision before, I'm going to ask, and this is the first time you're doing it or willing to do it. You've never given your heart to Christ. You've never really surrendered your life to him. You don't even know how it works. But you're willing to do that today. I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. After we pray and the service is over, I'm going to linger back here for a few moments. And I'm going to ask, if that's any of you, you have never truly surrendered your heart to Christ, then I'm going to invite you to meet me up front to my front left. And I want to spend some time just to pray for you, and then also to give you some tools that's going to help you to become that ecclesia that God wants you to be. And so if that's any of you in this room, again, this is not for everybody. A lot of you have already made the decision to follow the Lord. You've already surrendered your life to Christ, and you're just growing in grace. Praise God. I'm talking about those who have never done it. You've never surrendered your life to Jesus. You don't really know what that looks like. You don't know what's entailed with that. You want to make sure that the walk with God that you walk is intelligent. You want to make sure that it's effective. And if you don't know how to do that, please meet me up front. I want to just go ahead and get a few moments with you. Not long. A few moments with you. So that way I can see how, by God's grace, I can be of any service to you along with the pastoral staff that we have here at Open Doors Church. At this time, let us all bow our heads for a word of prayer and thank God for what he has shared with us today. Our loving Father, we are very grateful, Lord, for all that you have imparted to us. We thank you for the work of your Holy Spirit that helps us to behold your truth in a way that by your grace we can practice it. Please bless my brothers and sisters well beyond their expectations. And I pray that we all might open the doors of our heart, that we can come into open doors, if it be your will, to come to this specific local church, and that we will honor you with the rest of our lives. Bless us to this end, we pray. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer, for we ask it all in Jesus' name. Let everyone say, Amen. Amen.